Join our WhatsApp group to get daily latest updates. It's totally free. Part 1 The festival takes place over a long weekend. That is, it starts on the Friday afternoon and runs until Sunday evening. Normally, the festival would take place on the 4th of July, the same day as American Independence Day. But this year, we've rescheduled it for the 4th of August. Now, you can buy tickets for this festival either by the day or for the whole festival. The second option is cheaper, although, of course, not everyone can attend for the whole time. A day's ticket is $10, and it's $25 for the whole festival. That's very good value. If you want tickets, you're advised to get them early, because there are always more visitors than tickets. Space is limited, so buy early. You can get them direct from the festival organizer's headquarters, the festival office, and I'll give you that address later or you can get them from any of our three post offices or one of the many bookshops in the town. Last year, we issued them from tourist advice centers and the town hall, but this year it was decided to limit the number of outlets to cut down on administrative costs. Before the talk continues, you have some time to read questions 5 to 10. Now listen carefully and answer questions 5 to 10. The weather is looking good. The forecast is expected to be one of the hottest and sunniest weekends of the year, so it's perfect for the festival. Although I would remind you to cover up and be aware of the dangers of too much sunshine. If it gets too hot for you, you could always stay inside for some of the indoor events. And, of course, you'll be able to get food from sandwiches and snacks to barbecues as well as ethnic fast food from several stands. There will be a bar this year, but after last year, we will only be selling soft drinks, beer, and wine. We have decided not to bother with a spirits license. There won't be any whiskey on sale. So, what's on? Well, I can only give you a flavor of the many attractions we have coming this year. But if I can name one of my personal favorites, you must see Petey's Dozen, a traditional New Orleans jazz band. They were here last year and were so popular that we've invited them back. If you like classical music, we've got a string quartet from Poland, appropriately called Strings, playing classical favorites. We've also got rock bands, a blues band from the UK, a group of traditional Bavarian beer hall singers, and another of my favorites, the Fiddlers, who come from Ireland. Their special brand of folk music is popular all over the world. Moving on then to other attractions in the Red River area. For children, there's lots to do and see, from museums to theme parks. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part two. Section two. 
you will hear a man and a female bank employee talking about getting a loan. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 16. Now listen carefully to the discussion and answer questions 11 to 16. Good afternoon. County and District Bank Customer Services. Can I help you? Hello. I need to speak to someone about getting a loan, an overdraft. Yes. Perhaps I can help you. Do you bank with us, sir? Yes, my name is Mick O'Drew. Sorry, sir, your surname is... O'Drew. Mick O'Drew. But my full name is Michael. And can I have your account number, please, Mr O'Drew? Yes, it's 39261916. That's fine. Now, I just need to confirm some details for security reasons. What is your address? It's 24 Kilverton Drive. That's in Chalvey. That's C-H-A-L-V-E-Y. The postcode is S-A-3-9-E-R. And your telephone number? 0458-88320. And can you tell me your date of birth, Mr. O'Drew? Yes, it's 23rd of February, 1967. Thank you. Now, there are some gaps in your file here. I don't seem to have an address for you at work. No, when I joined your bank, I didn't have a job. Ah. Uh, but I do now. I work for Calver Engineering. That's in Carberry. The address is 30 Works Yard, Carberry. Could you repeat that? Works Yard. W-O-R-K-S-Y-A-R-D. It's two words. Right. Thank you. Do you have a work telephone number where we can contact you, please? Yes, it's 912 Seven nine five zero oh, nine. Uh, seven five zero oh, nine. No, it's seven nine five zero oh, nine. Oh right. Thank you. How long have you been there, Mr. O'Drew? Um, I started in nineteen ninety seven. No, nineteen ninety eight. Okay, that's fine. And can you tell me your current salary, please? Well, I'm not sure exactly, but it's about uh, eighteen thousand pounds. You now have some time to look at questions 17 to 20. Now listen to the rest of the discussion and answer questions 17 to 20. Now, you would like an overdraft. Do you have any other major debts? Uh, what do you mean? Well, are you paying a mortgage on your house? Yes. How much is that every month? It's about £450. I see. And do you have any credit cards or store cards? Yes, I pay £45 a month in credit card charges. Oh, and about £19 a month for my store card. That's with J.H. Oney, the clothes shop. Do you have any personal loans or higher purchase agreements? None whatsoever. Right. Well, the loan shouldn't be a problem. I can set it up for you in the morning. I've set your limit at £250, although you can raise this to £300 if you're still having problems. Just give us a ring if you need to. Oh, that's great. Thank you. Goodbye. Goodbye, sir. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers.
Now it turns to part 3. You will hear a conversation between two students, David and Maria, about the candidates for an election for student officers. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 23. Now listen carefully to the conversation and answer questions 21 to 23. Hi, Maria. Have you voted yet? Oh, hello, David. What did you say? Have you voted yet? You know, in the student union elections. Well, no. I mean, they've only just released the names of the final candidates. The first round elections were only held last week. But I voted already. Yes, but that's the first round. You know how this works, don't you? Well, not exactly. I mean, I thought you just voted. It's pretty simple, but it's made more complicated because this university has four colleges, not just one. Each college can have many candidates for each post. These are reduced to a logical number. Then the real voting takes place. So what did I vote for last week? That was the first round, like I said. You voted for the candidates for Peterborough College, that's all. There are also candidates from the other three colleges. Oh, I see. Well, there are seven positions to apply for in the union, although two of those are dealt with later in the year. That's the president and the vice president. Anyway, each college sends one candidate on to the second round, so that's four in all for each post. In other words... In other words... It's 20 candidates. That's quite a lot. It isn't when you think that there are 14,000 students at this college. No, I suppose not. Can they all vote? Yes, part-time and full-time students. Everyone. But most don't. Only about a quarter of those eligible to actually bothered. You now have some time to look at questions 24 to 30. Now listen to the rest of the conversation and answer questions 24 to 30. So, who are the candidates from our college? There was a leaflet about it this week. Some of the students stood as candidates for several posts before the final ones were selected. I think Jenny de Groot is standing for women's officer. She wanted to be finance officer, but law got that post. She seems to be more suited to working for the female students here. Yes, I like her. She is the best person for the job. I'm not sure I'd support Michael McCarthy for his post. He's putting up for entertainments, officer. Doesn't he arrange the Saturday night ban for the college? And the sports events? Surely he'd be ideal. He has so much experience. Maybe. I don't think he chooses the right kind of groups for the college. He's too way out. He's not my choice. Who's the candidate to be overseas officer? A Chinese student who's been here for just over a year. She's the president of the Chinese club, and she organizes some interesting cultural evenings for them. She seems to be quite capable. Do you really think so? She's in my seminar group for linguistics. Her English is quite poor, and she's so shy she never mixes with us. Oh, there are 30 different nationalities here. So she'd need to be more sociable. Perhaps Vikram Patel would have been a better choice. Yes, I think so. Who did you say was finance officer? Law? Charles Law? He does accountancy, so he should be able to cope with the post. He'd be responsible for a lot of money. I've always thought he was unreliable. And didn't he fail some of his exams in the first year? Doesn't sound too competent to me. OK, yes, you're probably right. Who's the other person on the list? It's Brian McKay. Oh, McKay. He's quite a character. What position is he standing for? 
He wants to be the liaison officer, the person who lets the teaching staff know about any problems the students might have. He's such a sociable person. He'd be a great communicator. Yes, he's articulate and well organized, but he wouldn't be my first choice. Anyway, they're only the candidates from Peterborough College. So we'll have to wait for the results of the real election next week to see who actually gets each post. Yes, we can discuss this again. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part four. You will hear a lecturer giving a talk on languages. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now listen carefully to the talk and answer questions 31 to 40. Thank you all for coming. Are we all here? Right, well, let's begin. Um, this lecture, as you know, is the third in our course, Introduction to Linguistics. Today, we'll be looking at a variety of different languages, not any one specific one, and uh, we'll be looking especially at languages which can help us understand how both language and languages evolve. Another issue that uh, we will be exploring is the way in which languages have changed over time. These are fairly complex areas, and they have proved to be rather difficult to grasp. And there are many different theories, uh, some of which we'll look at today. But first, I want to talk briefly about a few different ways of looking at a language. Now, the language we all speak, English, is what is called a natural language, like French, German, Greek. What do we mean by that? Well... <laughs> It's a difficult term to define, because most languages have evolved naturally, except for a very few, such as Esperanto, which was invented in the 19th century. So, I suppose that what we mean by natural is a language which we consider stable, fixed, um, not constantly changing. Now, as we know, all languages are in fact constantly changing, so it's something of a misnomer. But let's put it another way. Natural languages are considered by us to be permanent. They didn't appear suddenly. They grew up out of other things. Now, I want to contrast these languages with two other kinds of language. Pidgin languages and Creole languages. A pidgin language is a language which is forced into being by circumstances, usually some sort of situation where two groups meet and don't speak each other's language, and they invent an intermediary language, usually for the purpose of trade or sometimes war. An example is Tok Pisin, which is a pidgin spoken in Papua New Guinea. A Creole language, on the other hand, uh, develops 
from a pigeon into a full language. This happens when the pigeon starts having native speakers, that is, people whose first language is the pigeon. This happened in the case of the French Creole spoken in New Orleans, for example. Pigeons are found all over the world, especially in areas which are, or were, once important trade routes. The Caribbean, China, Indian, the Pacific. Basically, pigeons can be identified with one or two important characteristics. They are made up of parts of, of the two languages spoken by the group that have met. Uh, the trading groups or, or whatever, and uh, they are usually based on a simplified form of one of those languages. That is, their grammar is a less complicated version of the grammar in one language. They use vocabulary from both languages, but there are fewer words, so each word often has more than one meaning. For example, in Tokpisin, grass belong face, means hair or beard. The pronunciation is also made simpler as pigeons lose the complex vowels of the parent languages. Creoles, on the other hand, formed when pigeons are learned as a first language, are just as complex as so-called natural languages. They are expanded pigeons. There is often a considerable element of politicalization as the emphasis moves from communication, uh, which to pigeon speakers is most important, to community, which is the mark of a Creole. That is, a Creole is a, a community who speak a different, marginalized language. They often have to struggle to get their language recognized. As to where pigeons come from, there are basically two theories. Uh, the first claims that all pigeons are descended from a medieval trading language, uh, what you might call the first pigeon, called Sabir. This is believed to have been based on Portuguese. It was spread as the Portuguese traders went from place to place. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.